How are you, man? I am doing great. How are you guys? Doing great. Doing great. Always good to talk to you. And we, we feel much better after a Seahawks win. They had dropped five of six going into this game with the 49ers. And looking at that matchup, you're going, man, on the road against the Niners. I don't feel good about this. And they, they pull off a big win. I don't know how much of that game you had a chance to watch, but uh, whatever whatever you did consume, what was your impression of, of their performance? Yeah, you know what? I, it was it was impressive, and you think about it. I mean, I thought, hey, man, they get Christian McCaffrey back, second game he's back, is going to cure the red zone woes, and they're going to score a bunch of points. And this was one of those ones, you look at the uh, spread was like six and a half, and you're like, you feel like the Niners are going to get that done. Four or five weeks ago, they put up 500 yards or 450 yards of offense and, you know, like 34, 35 points or some garbage like that. And to hold them to 17, I just, like, I thought that was impressive. And then to put an 80-yard drive together at the end of the game to end that thing with that scramble by Geno Smith, I just, like, I was really impressed with being going on the road and doing the things they did and certainly didn't expect it from the Seahawks, no question about it, and thought the the 49ers were going to play their uh, ways back into contention. But, uh very impressive victory by the Seahawks. Very impressive final drive by Geno. Um, and, uh, you know, and to me, that would pretty much um, put a nail in the coffin of the 49ers in regards to winning that division and, and being a playoff team. Hey, Mark, real quick before I ask my real question. Uh, you, you're not like Aaron Rodgers doesn't have any control over your career or anything like that, does he? <laughs> no, why? Okay. Did I say something that he's going to get mad at me for? Well, or fired, you know, that that – is always sort of it seems like recently anyway it's always on the table so i just want to make sure yeah he didn't have any control yeah, no, 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 no. I, I don't think that rogers controls uh the the powers of being fox but i don't know that to be factual like he <laughs> yeah. he does he does seem to have i loved it i loved it when he came out a couple months ago and said wow the, the power that you guys think i have like i don't have wait a minute the reason we think you have power is because you have brought a bunch of guys who have retired and didn't tell anybody out of retirement (laughs) to play with you with the Jets. Like, there's nobody in their right mind that's a GM that would bring any of those guys in to play, and yet they're all on the Jets. Like, uh, he's so full of baloney, it's ridiculous. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just just a little bit uh, too big for his britches, but... um, Hey, I, I wanted to talk to you about something specifically, um, you know, and it goes back to like Junior Seau. You had to block Junior Seau, right? Every once oh, in a while. Oh, yeah, all the time, yeah. Yeah, we, we used to, we talked about slipping blocks or going underneath a block. And I brought it up a lot because, you know, you don't do it unless, you know, you can make the tackle. And, and I, I've been seeing Ernest Jones and he doesn't make a living on it. And that's the thing about slipping a block. And for people, I've explained this many times. It's like, you know, I'm supposed to take, let's say, the your left shoulder is where my gap is. And instead of going there, I'll go to your right shoulder, try to go underneath. So that way I don't I don't have to take on the block. And then but you have to take a really sharp angle to get there. And what I've said on, on that play Mark, is that it's like a changeup in baseball. You don't throw it every time, man, you know, because they'll, they'll hit it out of the park. But, you know, you, we saw Ernest Jones. He had, I think, three tackles where one of them, he slipped Trent Williams. So, you know, it's just it just seems like that kid is playing really well right now. And when you watch him, does it look like a guy that uh, Ernest Jones that would be hard to block? Yeah, well, that's uh, self-preservation when you slip uh, Trent Williams because he'll try to murder you. Yeah, like he's not—he's <laughs> he's not playing. Like, yeah. that dude, yes, that dude is a freak show. So that might be self-preservation. Yeah, I hated guys like that, Dave. Like I, you know, I got a big—you know me—I got a big cron- concrete head. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't have brain in there. I have a uh, rebar and uh, you know I got a rebar <laughs> and cement. Um, so it is not a lot of. Not a lot of brain uh, power. So, yeah, I wanted to run into you all the time. I love the guys that wanted to make it a, you know, whose head is harder battle. Yeah. And I hated the guys. You, what guy that used to drive me crazy is Teddy Bruschi because Teddy would get you where he would, you know, bow up on you, and he was shorter, so he'd get that leverage on you. And then he'd come up, and he'd act like he's going to bow up on you, and he'd slip you. And, you know, then you're just eating, you know, you're eating, you're digging for four-leaf clovers, looking for coins on the ground. You're like, God, got it. Um, and so 
Yeah, that slip block is one of those that just drives me crazy. And I'm 100% with you. Like, like I've always said this, and, you know, playing defense in college and being around defensive players, if you're going to do it, you better make the tackle. And one of the things is you got to cut underneath the guy, like you said, on his right shoulder. But as soon as you cut underneath, then you got to flatten out and scream down the line of scrimmage, right? Right. Because otherwise, those guys will just outrun you. So you got to change your angle, and it takes athleticism. A lot of athleticism to be able to do that. Most of the time, you got to take that guy on. You got to, you got to, you know, you got to roll over the top of that guy. But when you have that ability to not only be strong at the point of attack, uh, you know, to take a dude on, to cross his face, you know, and, and still have that kind of power to do that, and then have the speed and athleticism to to undercut that guy or to slip that guy, like those are the guys that are a problem for us as offensive linemen, because like I said, I just want you to run into me like that. Like that's, that's what I want. And the guys who don't give you that um, I've always found are the guys that they give you more fits during the course of a game. Hey, have you watched much of the Cardinals this season? Dave and I were talking about that. That's the next opponent for the Seahawks coming up. And you, you look yeah. at Kyler Murray's numbers and he's completing almost 70% of his passes, 12 touchdowns, three picks. I mean, it just statistically, he looks to be a bit different. I don't. Is he a guy, in your opinion, that maybe he's just grown up? He's maturing into being the quarterback everybody thought he would be, or what? What are you seeing out of the Cardinals in him specifically? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I've I, I've done three Cardinals games, so I've seen them a bunch and and watch a ton of their film. And um, one, like James Conner is one of the great football players in this league. Probably doesn't get enough credit. And you know, if you lined up every running back in football. Um, and ran a 40, he'd probably come in last, or he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be in the top 10, that's for sure. But great vision, great contact balance, physical at the point of attack. Um, he just does a lot of things exceptionally well, a real good football player. I love watching him play the game. Um, and so he is a, he's a real key. And then ultimately, Kyler, it's been really interesting. Kyler's so athletically, he's so quick, He's so athletically gifted. He's so quick twitch that when he climbs the pocket, oftentimes he uh, like when you when you drop back as a quarterback, right? You hit let's say it's a five step drop. You hit the fifth step in your drop. You're ready, like you're ready to unleash the ball, right? So if the first read in your progression isn't open, so you go da 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 da, and you you hit your fifth step, right? And you're ready to trigger. You like you're throwing the ball. If that's not open, you go, you hitch up, right? And and so that's where the next read in your progression is supposed to open up. And so and then it's the then it's one more hitch, and that's the third read in your progression. And then after the third read, it's a check down. You know, you just throw it out to the flat or whatever. But but the timing of each hitch times up to the route combination. And what you would see when you studied Kyler over the last couple of years, even early in this season that he's so athletically gifted that when he climbs the pocket and he goes up to that first hitch, he's ahead of the receiver coming out of the break. So then it's not open. Then he hitches again, and then he's in front of that guy. So, you know, it's the old uh, John Wooden. Um, you know, what, what was it? what's the old saying, John Wooden? Uh, don't be, like, be quick, but don't hurry, something of that nature. I, I can't remember the exact quote, but – he has to learn to slow his feet down and be smooth in the pocket when he hitches up. And they've worked on that. He's worked on it. He acknowledged it to me in the last meeting we had. Like, I just get I just get ahead of myself. And sometimes my feet are ahead of kind of where my route, route combinations are. And you watch him slow that down, and it really has added to his accuracy because – when he hits the first or the the first step, the first read in the progression, he's deadly. He is on target. It was when he got to the second and third read that things were just off from a timing standpoint, and he's worked diligently to fix that. And over the last several re- weeks, he's been so much better. And you you just go back and watch him in that second and third hitch. Um, he's he's delivering the ball on target on time, and it's it's because of his feet. Hey, Mark, I'm, I'm trying not to get too excited about Abe Lucas. Well, actually, I'm not trying. I'm, I'm really excited about Abe Lucas. And I, I know you've talked to him, and, um, you know, I think you had some connection with him. But 
I don't know if you get a chance to watch him play, but I feel like he just is a guy who can change the culture on the offensive line. I've been raving about this play where he runs 20 yards downfield and pushes the pile. And meanwhile, he's sprinting past a couple of guys that are jogging, you know, and I'm just wondering if that can sort of change the culture for an offensive lineman. You know, is it, is it something that you yeah. can get one guy to, to really do? And like, like I always say, make it cool again. Yeah. You know, one of the things that ends up happening to you, is you watch a guy that that plays you know next to you, and this happened with me with, with Gary Zimmerman. I was a Pro Bowl player when I came to Denver, you know, and I had some injury issues or whatever. But you know, I always played hard and played aggressive and played physical and all that. And lined up next to Gary Zimmerman in practice, and he's like running circles around me. And it was like, son of a gun, you're making me look bad on film. Like yeah. I got to pick up my game, you know. And so it was one of those things where you're like, shoot, I got to, like, because he'll make you look slow. It's like uh, put on the film with Ray Lewis back in the day when he was in his heyday, and he made everybody else on the football field look slow. As a matter of fact, I remember this time we were playing the Chicago Bears. I'm with Washington. It's 1991. We go to Chicago. And, you know, you have that Saturday night meeting, Dave, and, and you know, you just just the Saturday night meet, meeting and you guys talk about everything and you, you get the team meeting and then you split up and, you know, in different, you know, the offense goes to one meeting room, the defense goes to the other. And and Joe Gibbs goes, I want, to wa- I want you guys to see this. And he puts a film that he cut up of Mike Singletary on. Mm-hmm. And the principle <laughs> of this film was – Mike Singletary never turned to assess whether you can make a play or not. He just turned and took off like he had a rocket up his ass. And I am telling you, it was one of the most impressive films I've ever watched because they throw like he'd be in a hook drop at, you know, at 10 to 12 yards. And they throw a deep in cutting route on the other side, like a dagger concept, deep in cutting 18 yard route on the other side from where his hook drop was and he put his foot in the ground and sprint and get down there and get in on the tackle and create a fumble. And like, it was never one of those things. Oh, the, the, the place too far away. I'm not going to make it. Right. And it was like, we, we went play after play after play after play after play. And these were just like random cutups throughout the season. And it was every play he's playing at a different speed than everybody else. And it was one of those things that you just looked at and go, wow, like that's that's who I'm playing against. I better buckle up this weekend, right? And that's the kind of that's the kind of effect a guy like that can have on a football team. Hey, what what do you think of the effect or impact that Russell Wilson's having with the uh, Steelers? How much of their success are you putting on him specifically? Is it just, hey, this is a guy who's just fitting in and not screwing it up, or he's he's leading the charge? How do you see his his four, I think they've won five in a row and four in a row with him. Yeah, he's been impressive. Um, and I think the big, I think the biggest thing for me that's been impressive about Russ is I think Russ has really, like, I'll give him all the credit in the world for the maturity because when you watch the way they play the game, and now he hasn't been great the last couple of games. He's completed about 50% of his passes, uh, but he makes two or three deep ball throws a game that are just game-changing. They're unbelievable. Then the other thing that has happened is this is something I've complained about a bunch with Russ, his inability to throw and and throw the ball in the middle of the football field. And in his first, I haven't, I didn't look last week, but in his first three games or so, everything was outside the numbers. Like there wasn't even an attempt in the middle of football field. And so, the, the Steelers are doing very much what Pete Carroll did early in Russ's career. Here's what you can do. These are the things you can't do. We're not going to allow you or call those things. We're going to keep you in this world. And when he's in that world, throwing the ball outside the numbers, the quick hitches, the little, like the, the, the quick comeback throws, the boot keep stuff out, you know, getting to the tight ends and the slide and all those kind of things, the little flood routes where you're, where you're getting him outside the pocket. Dude's exceptional. Dude is exceptional. Always has been. He was that way in Seattle. And, and you know, that's, that's what he does well. And I'll give him a ton of credit for saying, okay, 
Things haven't gone well the last several years. My last year in Seattle, my two years in Denver, it's been an abject disaster. I'm going to get back to, to being coachable and doing what I do best. And as long as he does that, man, like it, it's exciting. It's, it's fun. And I'll give him all the credit in the world for that stuff. Hey, Mark, um, had something happen. The Seahawks going into this game, a lot of people are talking about, well, the Niners, you know, they don't have Kittle, and, you know, some guys are hurt and banged up and everything. But the Seahawks, fair amount of adversity. You know, that first they trade for Ernest Jones, and then they, they fire Dodson. And then Connor Williams um, retires, decides to retire. And, you know, the, the word was that, like, he was kind of withdrawn and, you know, especially being an offensive lineman, he wasn't communicating with his teammates and he was just done. And um, do you ever, ever come across anything like that? Because I think it's the one sport like where you really have to be settled as far as, you know, your, your mental discipline, emotionally, things like that. Do you ever come across to see a similar situation to that? No, uh, no, I, not really. Um, where a guy just kind of was checked out or just kind of done. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe in maybe in the in the off season or whatever, um, when he just didn't want to do it anymore. Been around for a long time, um, but you know, it's it's different today. Today's just different than when you and I played, and we weren't making any money. So you know you. You, you played as long as you possibly could to try to accumulate. And, you know, now guys play two or three years or four years, or five years, and they're set. I mean, they've made more money than, you know, than um, you can shake a stick at. And so it does give you better. It gives you more options to say, hey, man, I've had enough. I'm going to walk away. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm set. I've got generational type money and I can, I can move on with my life and figure out what I want to do after this. I mean, it does take a toll on your body, obviously. And I will say this, having played hurt, you know, my entire career, um, it, it's arduous mentally. It is, it is a, it's a grind. And I always had to turn it into a competition with myself. Like I, you know, I always felt like garbage. So like, <laughs> Like one of the big things I used to think all the time about about playing is, man, anybody could play this game if they felt good. Like I feel like absolute hammered crap, and I'm going to go out here and kick your ass. <laughs> and so it became a big challenge for me every week. Was like, I don't. I mean, I showed up to games where I literally couldn't hardly walk and played lights out in the entirety of the game, and and things that that I just w- was able to force my body to do. Um, you know, at that point in my, uh, in my life, but it was, it was exhausting. And, you know, I was always the first guy in the facility, the last guy to leave. I was always in it. I would come in at 5.00 AM and rehab until seven, seven thirty. Then I'd study film till nine. And then, I, you know, I mean, it was my, it was my daily grind every day, um, just to stay, you know, just to give myself an opportunity to be on the football field. So that, that stuff is exhausting. And, um, and, you know, I, I feel for a guy who just gets to the point where he's like, man, I've had enough. This is my body hurts. I feel like garbage. I don't like, I just don't want to do this anymore. So I understand how hard that is. Yeah. 27 years old. So not a, not an old man, even in football years. So we'll see, we'll see yeah. what he does, but to, Hey, just a quick thought before we let you go. Uh, are the Lions the best team in the league now? We saw the Chiefs finally lose, and we sort of talked about, yeah, they're undefeated, but they don't look dominant, and and they've, they've suffered a loss. I mean, I know the Bills are good if we're just looking at records, the Eagles, but the Lions, I mean, I know Jacksonville's not great, but they 52-6. to six. I mean, <laughs> does that speak yeah. more to how great the Lions are or how dreadful Jacksonville is? Yeah, I've been saying the Lions are the best team in, in football since week one, and regardless of dropping one early and, you know, and, and the Kansas City Chiefs being undefeated. They'll just, they, they can just, they physically can beat you up physically. They can run the ball on you. Um, they can finesse you. It just doesn't, it's just, any game you want to play, they can beat you at. They're better than you. They're, they're like Globo. Gym. We're better than you, and we know it. <laughs> um, so, so that, they're, they're incredible. And the fact that, you know, Jared Goff can go on the road and throw five picks and still find a way to will his team to a, a victory. Like that, <laughs> that game against Houston's unbel- It's unreal. Like that's when you know you're really good. When you don't have your good stuff, you don't play well. 
and you still find a way to win, that's when you know you're a damn good football team. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive to see what they're doing out there. Mark, as always, we appreciate the conversation. Great stuff. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll talk again next week. Sounds good, guys. Take care. Thanks, Dick.